telling you all about today. So, just a bit of a heads up, so you know uh, where we are heading. I'll be speaking about uh, the state of cloud native and uh, cloud and orchestration in general. So, to try to uh, bring everybody up to speed and uh, then speak about what we think is missing and what we're trying to do about it. Yeah, and that's, uh, that's basically it. Do a nice demo also in the meanwhile. So, cloud native. It's uh, the buzzword, especially at this conference. I feel uh, even bad about uh, mentioning it uh, again. But uh, yeah, that's, uh, that's the new thing. Uh, now that uh, we had DevOps, so for it, uh, it means a lot of things to a lot of people, but uh, my most important thing that it means for me is trying to chip away, to remove as much of the boundary between the application and its production environment as possible. In the most optimal setting, basically a development team deploying without any concern for how the application is exactly running in production and just doing that anytime, anywhere. But how do we get to this state? Uh, the Cloud Native Foundation managed to come up with a nice list of uh, ideas that uh, I copied from their page. Uh, Packaging applications as containers, first of all. This allows us to be much more flexible in moving application components around the infrastructure. Dynamically managing, now, now that we have smaller pieces that we can manage, we need an orchestrator to, uh, to more dynamically react to events, what happened to the application and move the pieces around, move them to the right place. And then we need to adjust the architecture of the application. Microservices seems to be a good fit for this. So uh, that's also why all the hype around it is currently. It allows uh, smaller to package the application to smaller pieces which then fit into containers and can be orchestrated. Oh, sorry, but uh, okay, so what, what are the limitations right now of container orchestration? Sorry, no, first I will speak about, I was I got the feedback, I should tell a bit about what container orchestrators are in the first place to make sure everyone knows that. It's a bit easy to uh, run ahead uh, when uh, working each day with this stuff. So, uh, yeah, so container orchestrators. Here on this picture you can see uh, three virtual or physical machines managed by a container orchestrator which could be Kubernetes or Mesos or a number of others. They manage Docker containers on the hosts. So each host is running a Docker daemon and whenever the client, the, uh, the application wants to launch a container, then Kubernetes or Mesos will figure it out on which node to run it. And depending on the available resources, etc. So that's, that's basically the, the job of the orchestrators. It's of course a bit more complex than that, but uh, let's not go into that now. So, what are the limitations? Right now, uh, these orchestrators are mostly used using static deployment descriptor files, which don't allow for all kinds, of, for some advanced scenarios. It's you just tell basically the orchestrator run this container this many times and that's about it. It keeps them up and running, for example, that's one extra feature it adds. Uh, but that's, uh, we can imagine scenarios where that wouldn't be enough. Also, the, the low-level policies that these orchestrators apply to, uh, to the to orchestration are not extensible and they're also pretty low-level, so uh, Extending them using reusable components that could be applied to different applications is not, not easy. And then there is the question, which is of what, not a burning question for many companies, but uh, some do encounter it, is multi-cluster orchestration. So cloud bursting, for example, I have an internal cloud and then I want to uh, run containers on a public cloud when my resources have run out, for example. 
But these orchestrators have APIs. So they have do this static uh, descriptor file thing, but uh, they also have APIs, so we can build on top of them. Like uh, you could have seen in Josh's talk a few minutes before, they're also doing something similar. So our infra loop thing is uh, sitting on top of the orchestrators. So again, there is Kubernetes and Mesos uh, interpret as, as one or the other. But it could be like one, on, one cluster managed by Kubernetes and another cluster managed by Mesos. <coughs> And InfraLoop can speak to these APIs and schedule containers in a bit different way. So, the concept we have come up with is twofold. On one hand, we would like to allow applications to be somewhat aware of orchestration, which might sound like a bad idea because we are mixing two concepts where we like to separate concerns. But for certain scenarios, it might very well be the right idea if we give the right APIs, the right high-level APIs to the application. It could do some things that otherwise would be left to the ops team to manage <coughs> in some ways. For example, running complex applications that consist of many services, like an ELK cluster where there has to be the right number of one service matching the other service. Uh, connecting in the right ways, or a database cluster where master and slave nodes need to be managed. This kind of, this is application specific logic, which I think is not a bad idea to bundle with the application if we can build it against a stable API that we know will be there for us in the production environment. Other examples would be that the application can react to certain events that are also application specific, like uh, queue lengths increasing too much or uh, reacting to bad performance, etc. The other idea is that we would like to have a kind of policy engine that, uh, into which we can plug policies that are not application specific, but we would like to, to reuse them. So. Uh, for example, a, a policy could be to minimize the cost. Let's say we have clusters of different costs because, I don't know, Amazon costs more than Google or the other way around. Or we could have nodes because one is larger than the other, so uh, or, uh, or, or a performance server than the other, but it's also more uh, expensive. And then we could have like a cost policy and the performance policy competing and being adjustable for the application and then placing containers on the, on the right, right uh, node or cluster. We, by the way, this whole uh, demo will be mostly about pushing containers between clusters. We didn't do the, the node thing, rather the cluster thing. Um, yeah, and also, for example, keeping capacity limits. So these, these two ideas are, are a bit competing. We are on one hand pushing logic into the application, but on the other hand, we, are, uh, we want policies that act on any application. So these, these don't exactly mix. So what we did was coming up with a small algorithm on how the application can negotiate with the policies installed on the cluster to achieve an optimal configuration over the cluster, optimal configuration of its containers over the cluster. So we did infra loop, which is kind of like this cool concept car. It's not exactly finished, and it's it's a concept. So don't expect a product that you can go home and uh, download and install on your production environment right away. It's uh, it's kind of like this. I'll show you exactly where, how far did we get. So. On the bottom of this uh, architecture diagram, you see three clusters with some containers running on them. We don't uh, show the, the virtual or physical machines here. We just say that containers are running on a cluster, which is the abstraction level of, of a container orchestrator. When working with a container orchestrator, you don't really see the nodes, 
but you see a cluster represented by the orchestrator's API. So on top of these three clusters running some containers sits InfraLoop, the cluster management layer of InfraLoop, which provides a unified API over Mesos or Kubernetes to the higher layers, which are where the interesting stuff is happening. On one hand, we see on the right side the policy engine. Uh, the policy engine is, as I described it, managing a set of policies that can be coded against, again, the InfraLoop API. And then there is the loop, which represents the application. Well, we named it a loop, it could be called application. This is just a bit funkier name for it. Um, so the, the loop is the part of the application that knows about uh, orchestration. And as you can see, the loop both talks to the policy engine to and to the clusters through InfraLoop. It's also called a loop because it's also receiving events from the clusters. So this flexible architecture allows us to, on a higher level, respond to events that happen on the clusters and start things on the cluster. So let's say the loop could be and could be Nginx or MySQL or your application consisting of 50 microservices. So and that that part is what tells the, the cluster to start it all up. And then but it doesn't do it alone. It does it together with the policy engine because you do want to have these nice policies that you don't want to write again and again for every application. So how does uh, the algorithm work? I will show it from two different perspectives. So the first one is how these components talk to each other. So first, Loop says, I want to schedule five containers. This is a very simplified example, of course. Then the policy engine uh, checks the state of the cluster and generates a list of possible configurations that are valid and optimal according to the policies. So it has a number of policies, let's say the cost and the performance policy installed, and then it will calculate based on the two which one wins, and offers the possible configurations in that order as it deems the best to the loop. And then the loop picks what it wants. This way, both the loop and the policy engine had a say in what gets scheduled. And then the loop gives it back to the policy engine which actually applies the new configuration on the cluster. Then there is the other scenario where the cluster sends an event back to the, and the policy engine reacts on it. So let's say there is a capacity policy where the policy engine will, actually the demo will show that one. The policy engine is making sure there is not too many containers running on a cluster. We are just counting them, we are not doing <coughs> CPU and memory and whatnot, we are just uh, simplifying it here. So the capacity has increased on a cluster. So now the policy engine needs to think again, okay, was it a cheap cluster? Maybe I want to move things over there. And again, it generates a set of possible configurations and again the loop will accept one of them. And policy engine applies that one. Yeah, so not very complicated, but it's, uh, it's, uh, it, it uh, creates a pretty nice uh, API. I'll show that one later also. So the other view of, of the algorithm. So this is, uh, this is showing how the generation of the possible configurations, what does that mean exactly? So let's say we have two clusters and one is cheap, it's like it costs one euro to run a container on it, and the other is more expensive, it costs three euros to run a container on it. And both have a capacity of two. So what the policy engine will do when asked to schedule three containers on these clusters, it will generate these four possible configurations. Then it will submit them to, the, to its own policies that have been configured inside it. And the capacity policy will first tell 
No, those two on the right side, those are no good because the capacity of the cluster is only two, so you can't, you can't do those. So then comes the cost policy that doesn't invalidate configurations, it's a different type of policy, it orders them. It says that uh, the bottom left one is cheaper, so let's, uh, let's put that one higher in the ordering and the second one is more expensive, so it likes the bottom one more because uh, the more containers are on the cheap cluster. And then would come the loop which says, okay, uh, the bottom one is fine for me. Here the loop didn't really do anything. Uh, in the demo scenario it will. So this is, this is what happens in the algorithm. Yeah, so I'll now show the demo which uh, will show a similar scenario. We will have a cluster cost policy which is pushing the cost of the cluster down. It tries to schedule everything on the cheapest cluster. Then a capacity policy that doesn't let more containers than the set capacity on the cluster. We chose these two now uh, for a purpose. These two don't collide. So one is a uh, hard limit and the other is a soft limit that just orders. And, uh, and the application will have some logic in it. That application logic will uh, will make sure that a containers a container always runs on each cluster. So the application tries to be redundant. This is again a very simple little demo, but uh, but kind of shows this interaction between the policy engine and <coughs> and the the application specific requirements for scheduling. Yep. So. Uh, Yeah, here we go. So, what you see here are four Kubernetes clusters. I had a bit of trouble with the Mesos one, so the demo shows four Kubernetes clusters. And four weave scopes installed, one on each cluster. So we're visualizing the, the cluster using weave scope. Just we modified it to remove all the controls here because uh, they didn't really fit on the, for, for these uh, small uh, rectangles there. They are running a Google container engine and we already have some containers here. So this one has two containers. Sorry, keep in mind that these are two containers because this one is actually the container that's running this UI and that's not part of the whole uh, demo right now. So just uh, try to ignore that one. We have two containers on cluster B, one on cluster D, and five on cluster C. And we have the capacity and cost policy. Each of them configured for every cluster. So you can see that uh, cluster A has a low capacity. It can only hold two containers, but is very, very cheap. So the, the algorithm will want to put things over there. B and C are medium cost, medium capacity, and D is very high capacity, but it's quite expensive. So right now, only one container is scheduled there. So if you just look at these policies, you'll see that uh, right now there should be no, according to the policies, there should be no containers on D, because two fit on A, and that's the cheapest, so that's where you wanna put them and 10 additional containers fit on B and C, which both of them are cheaper than D. But the application, when the policy engine generated all the possible configurations, then the application said, I would like to keep one also on D. I, I picked the cheapest one, but the cheapest one that also has a container on cluster D. So I will show you the code for this. It's super simple, which was actually the goal, so I'm happy about that. Uh, so this is the loop. And the loop in its apply method will get a list of potential cluster configurations from the policy engine. It, uh, it will filter them and find every one of these that has 
a number of instances more than zero on each cluster. So there will be certain configurations that are cheaper, but those will not be returned. It returns a list of configurations from which the policy engine just picks the first one. There is no more uh, stuff happening there. So this is the step where the loop picks the one which has more than one instance, uh, more than zero instances. So let's try to change something. Let's make, uh, let's give some more capacity to the cluster that has, that is the cheapest. And we can see containers are migrating from uh, one cluster to the other. Yeah, so it's capacity five, so we should see one more. Yeah, there it is, there it is. And they're disappearing from cluster C. The, the four weave scopes are not synchronized, so things are happening whenever they manage to refresh their state. Yep. And so basically this is, this is it. This is what uh, we could play around with for, for hours here. It would be a lot of fun, but I don't have that much time. So maybe let's uh, reduce uh, the cost of B, so we will get some additional containers scheduled there. While the scheduling is happening, I'll also show you the code, what's, uh, what's in the cost and capacity policies. Let's, let's do capacity first. So capacity says, uh, find from the potential configurations, return all the configurations where on every cluster we have a cluster capacity, we have number of instances less or equal to the configured cluster capacity. So let's say less than, less or equal to five, as in the case of B. So it will return again a set of these cluster configurations but only, but it will filter away, away any that don't don't uh, match its criteria. And as opposed to this one, so this one will filter, and then the cost policy cost policy will instead do an ordering of them. So the cost policy doesn't care; it likes all configurations, but doesn't like them all the same. So uh, likes some of them more. So here we are multiplying the number of instances with the configured cost of the cluster and sorting the possible states based on that value. So this is, this is the whole algorithm that it goes through. So you can see that each piece of this infrastructure can be coded very simply because the whole, uh, the, the whole API, the, the, the programming infrastructure, the API around it is, is done in a way where everybody just does their little thing and the whole uh, scheduling happens in a much more complex way. And that's, that's basically the, the goal here, so that neither the application developers nor the developers of the policies really have to do something hard. But still, they can do something way more complex than with static, they can do with, uh, with static uh, descriptor files. Yep, so where are my slides? <coughs> so, that's, uh, I'll just do a quick summary and then move over to some uh, future plans on where we would be like to go with this. Yeah, so we have orchestration using policies that can be developed against a simple API. And we have a high level API for creating application specific orchestration code. And we also added multi-cluster support because it's cool and because it wasn't all that hard actually. <coughs> so, where could we take this further? Right now, uh, intentionally, we had a we had two policies that aren't really in conflict. So the the capacity policy gets rid of some configurations and the cost policy. Uh, order things to as the to to get the cheapest one on top. Uh, to order things by the by the price. But what if we would have a cost and a price policy? They would be competing for uh, for resources for the for placing uh, containers on the cluster. Let's say we have we have two clusters. We have a fast and expensive cluster and a slow but cheap cluster then it's not clear where do we place our containers. We have to give our policies some weights, and then based on those weights, they will 
put for something here or there. But just weighing them is very static. So uh, what would be very interesting to do is to make a nonlinear relationship here. So make a nonlinear relationship between the weight of the cost policy and the current observed performance, for example. So this uh, graph you can interpret, yeah, I should show it here, not on my laptop screen, sorry. Um, so, also for the others, they will not see it, so, yeah, whatever. I will rather stand just here, it's a bit uh, weird uh, setup, so, sorry, yeah. Um, so, on the y-axis, you can see how much weight does the cost policy get. The more weight the cost policy gets, the more it will pull containers towards the cheap cluster. So that's not increasing cost, that actually dec that's decreasing cost by giving way to the cost policy. I hope you get that one. But, uh, probably could have been done somewhat simpler, but I didn't manage to do that. So the other, the x-axis, is the currently observed performance on the cluster. And what we see here is uh, on the left side would be the good performance. I should have noted that also there. So on the left side we have very good performance. So, uh, so we no, sorry, sorry, I'm mixing this up. No, on the left side we have bad performance. So, uh, are we good? Bad? Mm -hmm. No, we give weight on the right side to the cost policy. Yes, because the performance is so good that we don't care about performance anymore. We want to make things cheaper. Yes, so low performance on the left side. We have low performance on the left side. So we are, we don't care about cost at that moment. We we don't we don't care. We we have latencies of three seconds. We want to we want to put money into into moving things to the fast cluster because we can't have so bad performance. But as our performance increases, we want we will be willing to spend money less and less. So we can draw a nice curve where we want to go over into not caring that much about performance anymore because we don't want to spend money for going from 10 milliseconds to 5 milliseconds. We don't care about that. We won't want to waste money on that. So we, this, this graph would be an input to the policy engine to define a nonlinear relationship between the current performance and, the, and, the, and one of the policies. You can imagine this expanded to multiple policies and some, and it all becoming super complicated. So this is something we want to look into next. The other thing is, of course, what you saw in this demo, what we managed to implement till now, is a very simplistic, let's say, web application. It's a one type of container thrown all over many, many clusters. That's not really a complex microservice application. <laughs> Doing the same thing with complex microservice applications, would be way harder because you get a combinatorial explosion of uh, the possible configurations. So here we need some heuristics, we need to let go of the most optimal configuration, maybe we need to come up with something that is good enough and can be calculated fast enough. So that's another thing. And of course, uh, support as many orchestrators as possible. This is not a complete list of them. Uh, because it's actually an API on top of orchestrators, if you can write your app against this, you don't have to care what orchestrator is underneath, which is a nice thing. So supporting as many of them as possible, we are there with Kubernetes, we are, not, we are nearly there with Mesos, and we didn't uh, touch the others yet. Yeah, and I would like to thank uh, Cisco for, uh, for sponsoring this research, and remember to play for uh, helping us uh, come up with the concept. And uh, thank you all for uh, listening. <laughs> Are there any questions? Questions. Oh, we have a question box. We do. Yeah, no, see it. Yes, there. Ready? Yeah. Hi, thanks. Thanks for your talk. Um, I think that's a really cool project you guys are doing. Um, Thank you. I was wondering, do you know Ubernetes? That's uh, the project from the Kubernetes community that's doing something similar. Um, I was wondering what's the big difference between what you guys are doing and Ubernetes? 
To be honest, I didn't look into Kubernetes, so I can't tell you. Right. But I know there are also other like kind of past solutions on top of like days on top of uh, Kubernetes. So we are not alone in this space. So it's uh, yeah, we did our own thing. We looked into our own questions, but yes, there are others out there. We are looking at uh, Kubernetes, and it does uh, uh, federated management of multiple clouds. Uh, but that, that's basically the point. You have multiple clo uh, Kubernetes clusters in all kind of places, and be able to schedule applications among multiple clusters. What this thing does is uh, adding policies, so you actually add smarter ways to schedule different pieces in the right place based on complex policies. And, uh, and also, in this example, we didn't use Mesos, but uh, essentially it doesn't care about the scheduling. So basically, we treat Kubernetes and Mesos as uh, kernels of the operating system. We're creating user space on top of those. Yeah, thanks, Pini. <laughs> That's a better explanation than mine. Yeah, oh yeah, okay. Um, so you're running um, applications that run across multiple clusters. Now, as I understand it, things like Mesos can actually manage multiple clouds or data centers. What's the motivation for wanting multiple clusters as well? Uh, well, if you do the management on a higher level, it uh, it can be beneficial because what we what we feel is that the the, the APIs of these orchestrators on one hand there is like uh, like Josh said in his talk before there is vendor locking happening there so you might want to have just a thin layer this is not a very big chunk of code sitting on top of the top of the orchestrator so it's nice to maybe have a unified API and uh, and maybe do those things on a higher level because then you can have the pluggable policies etc so that that would be my answer yes. um, just to check um, you're just working on on the scheduler right the uh, distribution of software and the um, the so for instance the mesos or kubernetes specific configurations of how software is run in these clusters, that's that work is separate from yes. From your yes, we are looking on the on these orchestrators in a way like uh, a Java developer looks at the or basically we are the JVM sitting on top of these, right? So we, we abstract that away. So uh, and, and we we. We look at the at the orchestrator as if they were the operating system. So we need to build on top of them e different ways on each of them, but provide the same set of services on top of them. Okay, thanks. And, and we and we basically we we just suppose that they're there. We don't uh, we don't modify them or anything, so, and try to use really high level services from them to not try to do uh, really tricky stuff that might get unsupported with time. Questions have been heavily concentrated on the left. Do we have anyone on the right? I don't mean politically, just right of the room. No? Okay, going once. Going twice. Big round of applause for Adam, please.